Good morning, everybody. Uh, my talk today will introduce uh, some of the work of the Cherish Project, and we'll look at how we're trying to instill more precision in recording uh, eroding cliff edges uh, in the Welsh side of these, this Island Wales project. Uh, Cherish is a five-year EU-funded project. It began on 1st of January 2017, so we're coming to the end of our second year. And you'll note our trilingual logo uh, with Welsh, English and Irish reflecting the communities that we're working within. And on the bottom of the screen there you'll see I'm with the Welsh Royal Commission, we're leading uh, Cherish, uh, but with the Geological Survey of Ireland, the Discovery Programme uh, in Dublin, and also Aberystwyth University Geography and Earth Science. And they're bringing the palynology and the extreme weather expertise as well. And I think some people were talking about yesterday how, how uh, vital <coughs> that was to include that in these climate change projects. So this, this uh, current round of Ireland Wales funding is managed by the Welsh Government. Uh, and the specific objective we have to report to uh, is objective two, you'll read it there, to increase capacity and knowledge amongst uh, coastal communities of the Irish Sea for climate change. So two years business planning and five years project, and that's what we have to deliver against. How we deliver against that is, is the structure and the, the, the wider sort of uh, makeup of the project, our evaluations, our policy outputs and so on as well. What I'll talk about today is the way we're targeting data and knowledge gaps, and there are plenty of them still uh, in these more remote coastlines, and how we're mapping and monitoring some of that heritage with greater precision. Precision. We're still in the baseline data gathering stage, and then we have the other three years to begin to crunch that data and make it work for us. I won't talk so much about the, uh, the past environments and weather history, but that's a critical plank of the project. It's too small a project to be predicting and modelling climate change. That's for the bigger projects. We respond to published uh, documentation in terms of uh, how climate change, seeing how climate change is affecting the coasts of Ireland and Wales. Our latest climate change risk assessment for Wales from 2017 notes the importance of the visitor economy, the tourist economy, which is a key part of this funding, uh, uh, for these sites threatened by coastal erosion. But also they're very worrying that they have significant evidence gaps still. And that's part of the reason the EU has put the money in uh, to this funding stream. And that's what we're seeking to, to fill. So here's the, the project map. Wales looking rather small against Ireland. Uh, you'll see our Irish colleagues are rather more sensible than us, having uh, sort of five main areas. Uh, we've got many more. Uh, the project areas in Wales, they're on the right, selected uh, through a variety of uh, means on the basis of uh, coast edge type, erosion risk, uh, data and knowledge gaps, particularly those areas where we know nothing or very little, or have been too difficult to study in the past, or where we have potential for collaboration and partnership. We're testing our toolkit approach. Toolkit approaches are often talked about in remote sensing and archaeology. Uh, we're trying to make that work. Crucially, you'll see from the airborne laser scanning, the LIDAR right at the top, to the light aircraft, which is my day job at the Royal Commission Aerial Photography, down to the detailed survey and geophysics, the peak coring and OSL dating, the laser scanning on the foreshore, and then bringing the GSI in Ireland, the marine scanning and the wreck diving, which we hope to start implementing next year. Uh, so it's exciting. We're linking the terrestrial and the marine uh, and uh, making that work in a, a long-term project. In Wales, uh, we have a number of project areas, uh, but these are our uh, designated and undesignated baseline monitoring sites. These are the sites we're putting the most effort and work into uh, recording. These are the sites we'll go back to after key storm events at extreme low tides and so on, and they encompass uh, prehistoric promontory forts, listed buildings, uh, intertidal wrecks, and island sites. Uh, so there's a range of different types of site there, and, and most of the first year, uh, along with other things, but was also harmonising and agreeing these areas so that the stakeholders, the landowners, knew what we were doing, knew we were there, and were able to work with those communities uh, on the ground. I'll be talking at the top there about uh, Bardsey Island and Dinas Dinthley up in North Wales uh, this morning's case studies. We've done some work over the last decade looking at the erosion of coastal promontory forts in Wales uh, with other partners. Uh, but comparing historical imagery, historical data with present day uh, data is often tricky. You see an eroding coastal promontory fort here, 1946 heavily shaded Royal Air Force vertical photograph with a more recent 2006 Welsh Government vertical photograph, 
Verticals nowadays, uh, things you see on Google Earth are taken in flat light in summer to maximize vegetation, minimize shadow. Uh, but it's very difficult to sort of compare the cliff edge, the exact edge. Where was the edge of that site? How much has been lost? How quickly is that site changing? We also have significant data gaps. Uh, we, we reckon that uh, LIDAR data, airborne laser scanning, you need better than one meter resolution to begin to map cliff edges in any precision and certainly to begin to map archaeology. In Wales, this is southwest Wales, Pembrokeshire, famous area. That's, that's the data that's better than a meter in resolution. The coast is virtually missing, apart from the pieces we paid for, uh, the islands down at Skoma down here. So there are problems in mapping and getting precision in the coast edge. Yet we still have major cliff falls happening. Of course, in limestone scenery, this is South Wales, uh, Carboniferous limestone. This is always collapsing. Uh, but how quickly is it changing? This is an Iron Age promontory fort with a cliff collapse last year. How quickly is it changing? Did coastal erosion affect the prehistoric communities who are building these sites? Uh, we also have major losses. This is Storm Ophelia and Storm Brian last year, which uh, took the end off the Green Bridge of Wales, a big tourist site. Uh, but there is no 3D modelling data for the Green Bridge of Wales. We didn't get there in time with the drone, uh, but it's a natural heritage site anyway. So we know we can see how much has dropped off, but there's no way to quantify that. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a, no sort of metrical way to understand how erosion is changing uh, that natural arch. Uh, but these, these coasts are changing fast. Potentially the top level, the first and quickest way to gather baseline data is through uh, active aerial reconnaissance, something we've been doing in Wales since the mid 1980s to gather baseline data and legally monitor heritage sites uh, around Wales. And we're employing this in Cherish, up the coastlines there, uh, to take what we're doing in Wales across to Ireland uh, to show how effective air, um, aerial uh, monitoring uh, can be. This is a joint nation project, Wales and Ireland, doing the same survey approaches in both nations to the same standards with a single survey team. That's the critical thing. Uh, photogrammetric software is ubiquitous nowadays. You see it in all the PowerPoints. Uh, and that's a critical part now. Just flying with the aircraft, we can get about 30 sites an hour. If we orbit those sites, taking between 15 and 30 photographs, even in a rapid orbit, we can pop up uh, a tolerably good 3D model of that accurate to about half a meter. So already we're banking uh, modeling data for these sites. Uh, for the future, for, for the archive, and then we can choose to work on that or not. But we need that better data accuracy. At the start of the project in Wales in 2017, uh, we invested 25,000 euros getting uh, new LIDAR flown for six island properties, uh, which had no baseline geomatic data at all, no accurate geomatic data. Uh, and this was flown at 25 centimetre in winter uh, at low tide, so that's about the length of your hand, the pixel resolution. Uh, including quite remote properties like Grassholm, which is seven miles offshore, which has prehistoric roundhouses on it and a, gan a, grass, a, a gannetry on it as well, uh, birds nesting. Uh, and wonderful data like uh, Bardsey here, one of the larger Welsh islands, uh, where we have the, the high resolution data has made all the difference to recording. Uh, and we can analyze it with a relief visualization toolbox to really get all the information out for, for mapping the archaeology or pop it into 3D for more public outturns. Uh, you can see Bardsey here, a high mountain, the Manath, uh, a, a model farm and village planted on the lower lying slopes here with fields, the eroding isthmus, our study site, and then a headland with a lighthouse on it uh, to the south. So looking at the eroding isthmus of Bardsey, this is one of our baseline monitoring sites. Work has been done there in the past, not least by Tom and uh, Joe from the Escape Project uh, as well. Uh, so we've got a, a bit of a history of monitoring data on the coast edge uh, there. This is a maximum five meter elevation, the isthmus here. Looking at the current uh, predictions for uh, sea level rise and storm surges in Wales, we're looking at anything between two meters and nine meters in the next century of wave over topping of storm surges. So we're not just looking at sea level rise threat, but also up to nine meters above the sea level. Uh, that heritage is at risk from scouring, damage and erosion. Uh, and in Storm Ophelia, this five meter isthmus is essentially underwater for many days. Uh, and we visited this summer to look at the storm thrown stones, uh, some fairly sizable that have been brought up onto the isthmus uh, by the sea. And the geographers in the team can then look at the eroding cliff faces, find previous storm thrown deposits and actually begin to recover radiocarbon dating samples from those to see how often this is happening. The eroding uh, isthmus itself is producing prehistoric burials uh, and mesolithic flints. So there's plenty of archeology span popping out. 
The 25 centimeter LIDAR for Bardsley, the new LIDAR, is, is fantastic. This is a real uh, sound investment. You can see the sand dunes, the sand undulations on the beach there, mapped in, in uh, considerable detail. And even sheep, if you don't know what a sheep looks like, I put a picture in of one. These little dots here are individual sheep uh, standing in the fields here as well. So this is fantastic baseline data. Not ne necessarily just for the next three years of the project, but if people want to see what it was like in a century's time in the long-term archive. We're improving on that LiDAR data, building on it not only with GNSS, survey of the eroding edge, but also uh, modelling all the detail of that eroding edge, the topsoil uh, stripping and so on. Uh, with drone photogrammetry. Uh, my colleague Dan doing that, and you can see the, uh, the photograph and the drone image are looking pretty decent together. Because the, we're not expecting a huge amount of that rock to change in the next century, but it's this scouring of that soft edge and the sand that's going to be changing. So we can build a basic model of erosion and recession there from the 19th century mapping uh, with the present day LIDAR. Anything between 5 and 15 metres of that isthmus has been lost. But now we want to start modelling that more this winter to see the sort of softer erosion of that finer edge uh, to see how that's uh, being damaged and taken away. Looking uh, finally at uh, a case study of Dennis Dintley, Promontory 14 Gwynedd, seeing how our toolkit comes together in the intense analysis of a, a critically eroding site. This is a prominent and iconic uh, coastal promontory fort in North Wales. Uh, mentioned in Welsh mythology, the early medieval texts, uh, thought to be an Iron Age and Roman site with early medieval occupation. This eroding edge is cutting right the way through the fort. It's a geological triple SI, so we can't stop the erosion because the geologists want to be able to see that eroding edge. Uh, and we have some historic uh, coastal oblique photographs which show how much that eroding edge has changed. We can get some photogrammetric data off those 1961 photographs too. How do you tackle a site with a dangerous dynamic slumping cliff face. The bit of the site we're interested in is the top half metre up here, which is producing Roman pottery and shards. So we want to get out over that edge and recover uh, uh, archaeological samples, datable samples, paleo-environmental samples, without even necessarily excavating, just cleaning the section up. So we're talking to rope access specialists to get us over that edge safely. But where is the edge as well? You see these huge hunks of turf hanging over that edge. How do we define that eroding edge at this site. Our standard approach is to a site like this, analysing recent 50 centimetre LIDAR, which is very good, comparing that with a mapping from the 19th century, which gives us anything up to 45 metre loss of the cliff in the last century. And we've also done an interpretive topographic survey this summer, which we need to hash her up this winter. So there's many ways we can compare the eroding edge from the data we already have. We've commissioned high resolution radiometry now, geophysical survey, that's the coast edge on the left there. And um, we know we've got the total loss of the site potentially within about 450 years. Uh, so next year, we're going to start commissioning excavations on the west side here to, to date some of this, this, this site. This is not excavated. There's no excavations here at all. Uh, and we may even have a Roman watchtower in the center of the fort. So there's a lot of critical evidence we need to understand before erosion takes it any further. Uh, but we, we're, we're now beginning to test the best ways to record that edge. As I said at the start, Quick and easy with a light aircraft nowadays. This is 17 high resolution, full frame, 35 millimeter photographs, which gives us a tolerably good pop-up 3D model of that eroding edge, better than we've ever had for this site. Uh, and we can get that now uh, in a flight with a light aircraft. So this is a pretty good model. But of course, the standard approach to gathering more detailed data now is by drone photogrammetry. Uh, in the UK, we've had to train Dan up as a registered pilot with the Civil Aviation Authority. It's a National Trust property, so we have to have the landowner's permission to do this. It's quite complex, but once you're qualified, you can undertake drone uh, surveys safely, and this gives us uh, a resolution down to 17 centimetres of the site. But this summer, we're also out making a more ambitious laser scan survey of the, uh, the coast edge. 600 metres of the coast edge, over 50 scans, just took about three days, quite an intensive process with our long-range scanner. Uh, but this is really paying dividends now. We won't be doing this for 30 sites or 50 sites. We're going to be doing this for about four or five sites, our key critical sites, which gives us a stone-by-stone -stone model of that cliff edge for the first time. Uh, this is great. This begins uh, a process now where we can measure change, uh, measure how this, this cliff edge is slumping and changing, how quickly it's happening, or is it accreting? Is it, is it stabilising as well between particular storm events? So to the final points there, really, 
We've talked a lot about um, projects yesterday as well, three to three projects, five year projects. But at the end of those, you reach a real cliff edge. What happens to the data? And hopefully within Cherish, we're from national bodies reporting to government. So we're hoping that we have a long term archiving policy in place. So that if you want this laser scan data in 50 years or 100 years, it should be there in the National Monuments Record of Wales, still accessible. Uh, archiving big data, archiving 3D data is, is still a challenge. Um, but we also uh, have uh, policy arms there we can get out, uh, the policy uh, sort of recommendations for this project through the sort of connections we have to government in Wales and Ireland. But it's also about making sites like this relevant to the communities where they're based. Making a site like Dennis Dintley in quite an impoverished coastal community begin to work for that community, begin to pay for that community through tourism and boosting the tourism economy. So that's a sort of a little look there at what we're doing in Wales with the Cherish project. Please take home one of my newsletters and anything else that takes your fancy. Many thanks indeed.